Welcome to the Avalon Institute Wired to Lead podcast with your hosts Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. The Avalon Institute is on a mission to understand how individuals, teams, and leaders connect with others and the strategies they deploy to achieve the highest levels of success. Before each show, our guests take the Avalon Institute's Cognitive Peak Profile, available on our website at www.avalonleadership.com, and we discuss their unique cognitive leadership strengths. Thanks again for joining us, and here are your hosts, Cameron Gott and Perry Smith. Um, But we want to welcome our guest today for the Wired to Lead podcast. His name is Mark Ross. Uh, He is joining myself, Perry Smith, and my co-host, Cameron Gott. Uh, As I mentioned, uh, this is a regular uh, podcast that we put together. We talk to leaders, we talk to athletes, we talk to um, uh, uh, business leaders and students uh, as well. Anyone who who, uh, is doing very, very innovative things, uh, who is focused on leadership, uh, specifically, our guest today is, again, is Mark Ross, and Mark is focused on thought leadership. And we're going to get into some more specifics about uh, what Mark is, is uh, currently into. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, his conference that's coming up here in February called Brigadoon. It takes place in Sundance, Utah. Uh, I've been for the past three years, and it is a wonderful, wonderful gathering. So, Mark, welcome. Um, let, me, let me give a little context here. What we also cover in the Wired to Lead uh, podcast is we also cover uh, what we term as cognitive preferences. We have a particular tool on our website at www.avalonleadership.com. And this tool, this cognitive peak performance um, uh, assessment, shows us how our brains activate for certain types of information. Uh, what it also shows us is that we're all very different. Um, our brains activate in, in uh, different areas, and the following areas that we focus on are the associative processor or the quick processor in our brain, sequential processor, and then what we term as the I mortals. And the I mortals would be mover, observer, reader, talker, and listener. And the CPP identifies these hardwired traits in the brain. Uh, and the and the cognitive activities that your brain does efficiently versus those activities your brain may do a little bit less efficiently. Um, and what we try and get to is is we go into the definition. We'll be going over Mark's uh, CPP scores because he took the uh, the cognitive peak profile assessment a number of um, actually about a year ago, uh, I guess, Mark. Um, but we'll also talk about um, the things that we consider uh, uh, you know preferences that we utilize all the time. And then, and then maybe some blind spots as well. So with that said, I do want to, to uh, shift it over to Cam. Uh, Cam is, uh, is an Avalon teammate of ours, uh, also co-host of the broadcast today. Um, and Cam, I want to you know, kick it over to you and, and have you contextualize a little bit about what we'll be talking to Mark um, about today um, in regard to his preferences, and then especially some of the activities that he's involved in. Thanks, Perry. It's great to be here with you. And uh, Mark, welcome. It's uh, great to have you on the show. Uh, I'm really looking forward to speaking with Mark today. I've just uh, appreciated his work from afar and um, what he does with Brigadoon. Uh, this topic around thought leadership management uh, really has my attention. It seems like uh, that's the way things are heading. Um, you know, look at, looking out in social media of the, what, uh, who, who are the people that are getting uh, the most attention of these uh, thought leaders, like Adam Grant, um, Daniel Goldman. Um, etc. So um, anyway, I, I'm, uh, I'm ready to go, Perry, and, and really f- curious to bring Mark into the conversation. Well, let's, let's jump in. So, so Mark, welcome. Uh, you know, I led in there with, uh, with you know, the introduction to Brigadoon. Can you tell us a little bit about Brigadoon? Because I, I think that's very, very important. And, and let's get started with that. And then we'll, we'll, uh, we'll shift it back over to the notion about your cognitive preferences that we discussed before. I love it. Thank you so much for having me. Um, it's real thrilled to be here and uh, talk with you guys. I mean, I also admire your work, so this is a real treat to uh, be chatting with you. So Brigadoon is an idea that I've been noodling on for quite some time and finally got it off the ground in 2013. But the idea essentially was, can you get a collection of interesting, curious, 
and compelling entrepreneurs and thought leaders together for a few days to have conversations in a PowerPoint free environment, heavy uh, focused on fireside chats and really focused on discussions in kind of unique setting. And we've had success. Avalon's been a huge supporter of the Brigadoon Project. And um, it's been a lot of fun. You know, we're going to do our sixth event in February out of Sundance Mountain Resort in Utah. And we'll have anywhere from 35 to 45 people from across the country and um, from different disciplines, different sectors. It's a real kind of a mashup, if you will, of different <clears throat> leaders that are doing really good stuff, whether it be sports management. Uh, we have an author coming out. <clears throat> we have folks that specialize in uh, cryptocurrency. So um, the idea is like, can you mix up and get some interesting people together for a few days to really learn and uh, develop new skills? Well, it, you know, it's, it's interesting, Mark, because uh, I mentioned before that we've been to Brigadoon um, and we actually presented there. Um, you, you allowed us to present uh, our, some ideas and notions of, uh, and, and you mentioned mashup because it was a mashup around uh, cognitive preferences. Uh, what's fascinating, I want to relate this to the audience and, and um, again, our producer, Brendan, uh, will pull this up on the screen. Is Mark, your let's let's start with this notion of your your preferences, which, you know, as we look at our scoring on the CPP, you're a 75% associative and a 25% uh, sequential, which means that you're a big picture guy. So so let's let's put that together with Brigadoon. You know, you you started with an idea. Can can you tell us a little bit about like what was the initial uh, incarnation of Brigadoon? I mean, you started it, and how how many people showed up? Sure. I think, well, it's, I think it goes back even further. Like for most of my life, um, you know, I've always been involved in like student government and just getting people involved. And um, I always felt like if I had kind of an eclectic network of friends and just met interesting people in my work and um, just kind of different passions I have. And I thought it'd be really fun to almost have a winter camp, right? Like, can you get some interesting people together for a long weekend? And, you know, I've met interesting people at dinner parties, but can you expand it over a few weekends and um, you know, it was something I was newly on for a while. And finally in 2012 at Thanksgiving, I was like, I'm going to do it. And we planned a flag and I sent an email to 30 people literally just saying, this is what I'm thinking. Um, do you want to help me get this off the ground? I've rented a house, Sundance, Utah, uh, come up, I'll put you up and we'll just chat about this. And um, eight people showed up, which was great. And uh, we just kind of brainstormed on this idea, like what it could look like, what are kind of the goals and visions and um, from different folks, uh, people that never even met each other, um, which was great. And people, I, and some people I barely even knew myself, uh, but I just found them interesting and thought they could add some value. And that was kind of the launching point, which I think is kind of um, from a business model standpoint, you know, like my MBA training, none of this would make sense because, you know, like there was no, there, there was nothing other than an instinct and a house and uh, a network. Right. And people well, a, a house in Sundance, that, that oh, yeah. matters. It's, yeah. it's not a, it's not a house in uh, Poughkeepsie. Yeah, we were in Wichita. <laughs> so that does help. I agree. Um, loca yeah, location, location, location helps. But um, that was kind of, it was fun. And it, like, there was no, I think the cool thing was there was no, whatever happened, happened, you know, I knew there was something there and like my expectations were always to like keep it small and organic and grow naturally. So it didn't have to have this huge, you know, formal launch, if you will. And I always knew it would kind of just roll out, which I think was kind of successful to have that um, kind of vision to think, you know, big, but act small, if you will. Um, well, you know, you know, well, you know, what's interesting, Mark, and, and Cam, you know, back me up on this, if you will. When, when we work with a lot of high associatives, they, they really function in a very, very similar vein. They start with the idea, and then they add the layers after that's, you know, after, after the idea starts to really gel for them. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, and and it's, at the same time, they also trust, you mentioned intuition, and we can go over some of that with your other preferences, um, you know, the mover, observer, reader, talker, and listener. But what's interesting about it is that you saw something and you acted on it. Um, and and that's that seems to be a very very common theme with with high associative entrepreneurs. They, they we had we had one on the pr uh, program we had an interview last week. Um, Kiko Matthews who's rowing across the Atlantic in a rowboat. Yeah. Another very high associative. But she said, "Look, I've had this idea," and then and then that's it. She said, "Okay, here's the idea. I'm going to actualize this. I'm going to make it happen." And she she started uh, again to to work on the strategy after the idea coalesced. Um, 
Go ahead, Cam. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sure it's for, I certainly know it's not for everybody. Um, and maybe, you know, I've tried to, and I think with, with the help of actually the uh, preference survey, it's actually helped me to A, you know, recognize kind of um, my skills and embrace like what I'm good at, but also recognize where I need help. Um, and there's no right or wrong, right? But right. I think just recognizing your kind of talents and maybe um, where you, you, you have um, other aspects you need, where you need help is like super important. So um, I always found the preference study great. Um, and I think it is interesting. Like, I don't it is when you go down this path of entrepreneurship and vision and where you try to go. Um, I think at the end of the day, you ultimately, I mean, maybe this is a bias because of my cognitive preferences, but I think you really, at the end of the day, you have to execute, right? You got to ship and you got to get it that's out right. there and get it into market. And um, there's no time that's perfect. Like I think about all the big things in my life when I went to school, certainly when my wife agreed to marry me, um, you know, like <laughs> moving, you know, I mean, there's never a perfect time to do stuff. And I think if you get, if you're waiting for that, you can kind of miss out on life and kind of opportunities. Right. I want to comment on something you just said there, Mark, um, that I really like, uh, think big and act small. Um, and I see that in my work with a lot of uh, high associatives or active associatives, they can, get cut, they can get caught in this paradox of actually a flip of that, where they're thinking too small and they're trying to act too big, right? They're trying to yeah. take off giant ch chunks of like, I got to do this and the do is too big. Right. Uh, and then the thinking is they're down in the weeds, right? They're at this granular level thinking about details and they need to be thinking about big concepts, big, bold ideas. And so that, that mashup, you know, I'm going to just mash those together of that think big, do, do small or act small is a really uh, great hack for uh, someone who is uh, you know, typically an active or high associative. So that's great to hear you saying that. Yeah, I think, I mean, for me, I'm always like, because I easily get distracted and I have so many interests and um, like, you know, my to do, like the amount of books and this, I just am overwhelmed with like noise sometimes that I really, it's almost like, that's a good word to say hack because I have to find out ways to like kind of manage this and developing processes and also thinking long-term. Like, you know, to me, Brigadoon is like a 25 year project. You know, would I love it to be as big as, you know, people are like, oh, this is like Ted or Davos and whatever. I mean, I think that's, you know, ridiculous. And it doesn't matter to me because if it gets there, it gets there, it doesn't. But the key is like getting it off the ground and moving it forward is really the kind of key. And I think working on presidential campaigns, I just realized how hard it is to get people to pay attention. And, you know, it takes a long time to do stuff in this country. And, um, there's a lot of projects that weren't like we think Microsoft happened yesterday or, you know, Facebook or what, any company. I mean, it takes years of discipline and success to move forward. It doesn't happen overnight. Like, you know, Ford has been around making cars for over a hundred years and that's a long time. Right. And they're still not, they still have problems and challenges. So sometimes I think as an entrepreneur, you have to step back and um, think, yeah, I like, yeah, think small, but also have like that big vision, like just kind of eat, take little steps to move forward. Right. The, go ahead, Perry. Well, uh, Mark, I mean, I just want to ask a question about that, because again, I relate that to, to the notion of Brigadoon and in, in, in a way, and, you know, we're, we're broadcasting out of the D.C. area here. Uh, Cam, you're down in Charlottesville. Um, but it, my question to you is, Mark, you know, at some point you said, you know, we can't do something like this kind of in the bounds of Washington and, you know, people's perceptions of Washington are. That um, you know that, that you know there's either dysfunction or there's uh, you know lack of momentum or inertia in Washington, and so if you want to break those bonds, you've got to leave. Sometimes, um, do you find that uh, that that at Brigadoon that you know how do people change when they get there? How, how, what do you see that you know the, in people that you observe? And, and I'm going to relate that to your preference because you are a high observer. I mean, you sit and you watch people. <laughs> you know, you can that high observer allows you to deconstruct. Uh, to, to notice what they're saying, you know, to notice what they're doing specifically and, and how they're adjusting out, out, out of Brigadoon. So obviously that, that seems to be a pretty, pretty strong point for you. Yeah, I think Cameron, uh, you know, mentioned Sundance. Sundance, if you haven't had a chance to go out there, it's a really special place. Uh, it's, you know, Robert Redford's uh, project. And of course, everyone knows about the film festival, but he has a resort. And the key, there's two things. 
it's easy. I think there's two things about why Brigadoon is successful. Um, a, it's easy to get in and out of. There's a major hub there, airport, Salt Lake City, in and out. You're only an hour to Sunday. It's maybe 45 minutes to 60 minutes. So logistically, it's like super easy. Get on a plane, fly a few hours, <clears throat> and uh, you drive an hour, and you're at you know 7,000 feet up in the mountains, which is pretty spectacular. Yeah, it's, it's totally Second, cool. like the part about being at Sundance and the property is you're stuck in this little canyon, right? And Sundance is a small little property. There's one lodge, you know, there's one restaurant, there's one coffee shop, there's one bar. And the properties are all little kind of like uh, almost uh, little houses. It's almost like a campus like setting. But the fact is you're in this Canyon and you're kind of stuck there. The cell service is a little dodgy. You're at elevation and you're just surrounded by these magnificent uh, mountains and forests and the combination, I think, of like thought leadership and being in a place kind of like the whole Redford vibe of like Hollywood and creativity, plus the idea that you can like go skiing or snowshoeing or take a photography class just kind of lends itself to, a, to me, a very natural place. And it really lets down people's guard. It's almost, I find it's almost like they've given themselves permission to get off the grid for two days or three days and, uh, you know, spend some time with interesting people, which I think is crazy important. I mean, the people that attend Brigadoon you know, they're off the chart, they're outliers, they're crazy ambitious, you know, um, and it, they need to say, hey, I've done, I've done good for the year. I'm allowed to have a few days to hang out with some interesting people. And, right. And uh, which I think the, is, is lacking sometimes with entrepreneurs and thought leaders. Yeah, it seems like a really creative and innovative way to, to get some distance from the noise. Correct. But I think yeah. that, that that's the, I think that's the big thing going forward. You know, in, in a way, I'm an attention coach. Um, and, uh, that the whole attention economy, right. Of everything vine trying to basically vie for our attention. So this, I think we've got to make a deliberate effort to, uh, get up and away so that you can, uh, clear the static and actually think big, right? I mean, it's, it's an exercise. No, I totally agree. I think like I'm looking at this sailboat behind you or, you know, I th it's funny when I get outside of the DC metro area or you know, you go anywhere we can see stars, you know, it's a, a reminder that there's like the big planet and, you know, it's just, it's refreshing. And it's almost, uh, I get back to the idea of like summer camp or winter camp. There's like that childlike wonderment of like, wow, the world is an amazing place. And um, I think finding venues like that and, you know, Sunday nights is special, but I, you know, I even talk to other folks that are thinking about doing thought leadership events and, I've always stressed find a unique place. Don't do it at the same old kind of conference hall, you know, PowerPoint projector. Yeah, I mean, think creatively. I mean, people want different aspects and there's a lot of venues around the world, you know, that lend themselves to that. I think finding those places to have these kind of discussions and giving yourself permission to kind of relax for a few hours or a few days is really critical. I got um, it. The thing that's got my attention here, along with Brigadoon, is around this notion or this um, concept of thought leadership management. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about that, Mark? Of, of I understand thought leadership, but when you talk about thought leadership management, uh, what are we talking about there? Yeah, I think it's a, it's a real um, combination of public relations, public affairs, and kind of learning, uh, taking almost like a presidential campaign style to uh, managing and directing your thought leadership, right? Some folks start out at a very basic level, like a blog or social media, and then maybe you're ramping up to you're actually leading your own kind of conference or thought leadership weekend. Um, and we help organizations and people try to figure out that path. I think, as you alluded to, the attention economy and there's so much distraction, and um, but at the same time, there's so many tools to like tell your story. So the management idea is like we help people, once again, thinking small, like these are the tools you have and we're going to help you get where you want to go. And that may take a few years, um, but that's kind of the management side of it. Uh, well, okay. So, so how, what, what is your perception of, of how patient people are for the management side of it? When you say it'll take a few years, I mean, are, are we, are we struggling now? Um, of course. I mean, like if you're a chief marketing officer, you, you know, like you're half, you're like 18 months. I mean, yeah, you're such a demand for instant gratification and that people, they just don't know how hard it is to get people's attention. And it's, it takes a lot of work. And, um, if, and it takes patience. If people knew how to like create a viral video or whatever, whatever your metric is, whatever vanity metric you care about, 
if they realize like how long that takes, I mean, there's so few people that are, like successfully happen overnight and people that even overnight successes, it's taken them 10 or 15 years. And I think about, you know, in, in stuff that people write about or just if, whatever blogging, I mean, one blog can probably be used 10 or 15 different ways, right? But people don't think about that creatively and just like thinking long-term is essential, but it's tough. Like people want instant, you know, gratification. I have clients that are invariably, you know, they're never happy. They want to be in the New York times or the wall street journal every day. And I'm like, Oh really? Nobody yeah. else wants to do that. Nobody else wants that. So. Well, <laughs> hey, Cam, I mean, we could talk about this because I think, uh, you know, let's, let's go back to these preferences though a little bit, Mark, about what you said, is this, uh, that you, now this is an associative thought. The, 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 uh, the notion of time uh, for, for people who, who, you know, don't quite understand. Um, we mentioned associative thinking or fast thinking. Time, um, help me out with the explanation of this, Kim. People don't necessarily perceive if they're more of a high associative of time as, as, um, as uh, increments as opposed to events, correct? Right, it can be uh, events, but it also, I mean, uh, let's not limit it to just events. It can be a very emotional thing. Um, in what regard? Um, that it can be, uh, I'm just saying, I'm going to throw this word out, multimodal, right? It, it, mm. it, uh, we can experience, I'm a high associative, uh, over 80, and we can experience time in a lot of different ways, uh, often not sequentially, uh, which makes sense. And, and there's, no, uh, there's no preference here, right? It's, uh, or, or a preferred uh, way we do it. It's recognizing, you know, how does time show up? So the, the thing that I notice with my clients is that um, we will, they'll see time as a very a volatile commodity, right? Which is uh, the value goes up and the value goes down. And so then that gets into a whole host of challenges around uh, execution. Right. Is it if you see, you know, you've got a window of time, three weeks, feels like an eternity and uh, you've got, you know, your value of time is around uh, twenty seven fifty. Right. Uh, and it's not three hundred and fifty. When it comes three hundred and fifty, you're, you're going to really protect it and not give it away. So it's that variability of of that time. And it's there's several different um, factors that, that come into play right? Emotion, how we're feeling uh, in that moment um, and our environment too, right? If, if we're in, in the, if we're chasing our tail, uh, we, we feel like we're behind the eight ball. Um, then we see, and we see time as uh, the enemy, right? That we've got to uh, uh, ninja, you know, hack, manage, crush, uh, kill, kill. <laughs> it's not it. Right? It's really about the time just marches on and it's what we do with that time in that moment. And so this sort of being aware of time and recognizing it is a commodity just as your attention is, just as your energy is. Um, I have a handy you know, acronym here, T, uh, T-E-A, of you know, these are the things that are our real um, resources, time, attention, and energy. And we recognize they're not infinite. That's the other thing that a, a high associative can get fooled into is thinking they have all the time in the world, right? Mm. Um, and so then they go these deep dive Alice in Wonderland uh, moments and get lost in research. And um, as Mark was saying, right, it's, it's really about the execution and you know, executing and then um, getting out of that execution, right? It's, it's getting out and stopping or completing finishing, closing the loop, and then moving on and pivoting to the next uh, task at hand. Well, it, it's interesting, Cam, because <clears throat> I, I've actually, um, Mark, you know, and as well, you, you've had some athletes. Um, you had uh, the pro boxer Heather Hardy who came out to, uh, to Brigadoon, and she told her story. Yeah. Um, and we've, I, I met with Heather um, up in New York. She's a, you know, boxes out of Gleason's Gym. And I think that you know Heather um, is what we call a dual processor. Uh, she she thinks uh, pretty much from what ba or balanced access between the associative and sequential. Um, but it's interesting because her notion of time, uh, uh, as we discussed it, was very much in line with with her achievements. She 
and bro she basically broke everything down from a time standpoint. You know, I'm gonna I'll train for this fight. When I get through this next fight, then the training will begin again. And there's there's cycles of time over and over and over again, um, always leading up to to the point where she, you know, in her boxing career would um, be able to have a step off point and, and remain undefeated. Bigger vision, notions of time, breaking it down into, into, into even finer increments. And a lot of athletes, um, you know, when with, in talking with athletes and informal discussions and athletes that I've counseled as well, um, especially football players, they get the four year increment because four years for them in terms of time and, and, and it, it settles them. They, they started uh, generally in, in uh, Pop Warner football, played about four years. They played four years in high school, and then they have a four-year increment in college. And right. so the, you know, the, the step-off point in college or going into college after having those two four-year increments, you know, going into college is a huge next step. But then you start to break down the time commitment. So, okay, wait a second, let's break this down in your training here. Year to year, where do you want to be as a freshman? What, what do you want to accomplish? What do you want to accomplish as a sophomore? Playing time. And then eventually you'll graduate as a senior, and 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 that framework and that um, you know just the ability to, to to slow the process down for them and not make it so big uh, seems to really really resonate, and, and it does settle them into that process. But um, that's that's just my little diversion there. Um, no, I agree. Yeah. I think I, I mean I used to uh, you know play when I was much thinner and more agile. Um, yeah, I mean I played soccer. I was able to play one year in Division One and yeah. You played. You, tell tell the audience where you played. Come on now. <laughs> played in Western Michigan, in, yeah, uh, Kalamazoo, the Broncos. Um, then I got distracted by other things, unfortunately. But I think about like uh, being an athlete. Like seasons are like really critical, and even uh, campaigns, mm -hmm. like election campaigns, have a start and finish. And I think I find that really um, kind of rewarding. Whereas, um, and I want to. It's funny about like I don't want to sound like I'm not completely enlightened on time. Like I do have a long term vision. Brigadoon and a piece of myself but it is like when you're talking about camera like I myself struggle with like you know am I using my time appropriately is this like a good you know I catch myself is this a good use of my time and um the yin and yang of that is really kind of critical but I think too it's funny Brigadoon I didn't really start until I don't know so it's been six so four I mean I've been thinking about it for like well into my 30s right but I didn't really execute on it until my late thirties, let's say. Right. And, um, it was a great tool for me because it created like another cycle in my life. Like there's a natural planning, like it happens once a year. And, you know, I find it very, uh, kind of rewarding. Whereas other projects I work on, you know, there's, there's no end date, you know, for some campaigns or message communication efforts. And those can be really distracting. And I think, um, finding like, victories or you know trophies where you're, you're trying to do x things and achieve stuff along a path can be a little more rewarding because it's a bit more tangible than saying you know hey we want to do whatever some kind of big sky there's no if you don't have those kind of milestones it's, you can really get lost really quickly right and it's a, it's a matter of um identifying and acknowledging those milestones right and and taking that moment because again as perry laid it off in the beginning with with the the, the the fast processor will often kind of just pass right over the victory. Um, I've got too much to do. I don't have time. Yeah. That uh, I've mentioned this before that um, this, this whole practice of reflecting uh, is, mm -hmm. is uh, very woeful in, in, in society and in business and that we see the tremendous benefits from pausing, reflecting on an experience, right? Moving forward. So, yeah, no, I think we're, it's funny because you mentioned about teaching, Perry, and I, um, Cameron, I think we're so blessed and we have so much access to information. And there's two data points. Like, I think about my grandfather who left Scotland, he left Glasgow to come to Detroit to make cars because that was like a better option. And then, you know, within like two generations, like I have this ridiculous life in Washington, D.C. And um, I think about that, like just how insane that is, like those kind of time decisions. And then just meeting with young kids, I teach, you know, GW and I've lectured at schools that like Hopkins or Georgetown schools I could never get into myself. And I'm there, you know, lecturing to these kids and they're so, these kids are so smart and they have so much access to information, but yet they're also like struggling with competing. And I always like, take a step back. Like you go to like one of the best schools on the planet, you work in one of the best cities in the, in the world, like you're going to be fine. Like look at the big picture and like, you know, try to direct them and say, 
you have this talent, are you using it appropriately to achieve something that'll make the world a better place? Um, okay, well, wait, let me jump in. I, I want to, I want to use the word competing. Can, can you expand on that? When, when you say competing, yeah, I mean, are they competing with themselves, yeah. with each other, with, uh, you know, yeah, what? With I remember this lecture vividly. I was at John Hopkins and, you know, the kids that go to Hopkins up in Baltimore, insanely smart, right? Global, smart, all valedictorians. Um, and I mentioned that I had an internship, you know, in my, uh, I was looking for an intern for the summer. So my lecture was like 45 minutes and, you know, I did some Q and A. So an hour later I'm walking out and there are kids that had emailed me, right? During my lecture, they'd found me somewhere on LinkedIn or my email, <laughs> sent me their resume. Right? During the lecture. During the lecture. Wait, completely focused on what you were saying as they were emailing you. Well, it was like, there was, <laughs> the, there was like a competition for like, I need this. And, you know, and I talked to um, just young people that are very talented and they're just really worried that they're not doing the right thing. It's almost like we put too much pressure on them. And, you know, I'm like, you go to UVA, you know, you go to Georgetown, like you're going to be fine, you know. Think about what you're going to do. Whatever, you, you know, you decide. Because I'm like, I went to, you know, not great school. You know, I just think about, I'm just, you know, it's all going to work out. So but having that, like, not worry so much about the competition, but taking a step back, realizing that you have talents and you are special. And um, it's all right to do fun and creative things. Like, there is no right path to get to wherever you want to go, which I think is a challenge for folks. Well, Absolutely. Here, yeah. And, and here's, here's a, a little bit. I've had similar experiences here. And, and uh, you know, we, we uh, one of our, our scope of works, uh, scope of work here at Avalon is around millennial leadership. Um, having such almost, you know, unlimited or unfettered access to, to subject matter experts is something that we didn't grow up with. You know, we're, we're, we're a bit older here. Um, and, and sometimes I, I look at that and I say that is, that is almost too much of a gift. Because it's one thing um, to, to send the right message and make contact with somebody, but if you don't have a plan or that map out for, for, the, for the, okay, so what? Cam, you know, we talk about the so what, well, what, what's next? Um, you know, what is the real plan upon making this, you know, making this incredible contact with somebody and, and, and stimulating a conversation? Um, do, you, do you offer something? Do you, do you ask something? Um, but I feel like there's, there's a bit of a gap and, you know, this is, this goes a lot of what we talk about too. Again, this is the age we live in. This is a technology age, technopoly. Um, uh, I studied a lot of this at NYU. Um, but, but what it comes down to is, you know, you, you, you mentioned a lot of the, the how you process information and, and, you know, to your credit, there's a lot of, you know, self-reflection and understanding, Hey, there is a blind spot. Is my time being utilized the best way? You know, I think, I think it, it's so, that is so important um, because it's one thing to just to, you know, put the action forth, but then, then the follow up after that, if it just kind of fritters away, then, then, you know, what's the point of that? Did you use your time appropriately? No, probably not. You know, did I email in the middle of the lecture? I might've gotten someone's attention, but is that <laughs> what, you know, what's the impact of that? Right. To what end? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Hey Mark, I'm, I'm, I'd like to move in a direction around, um, these sort of these areas specific to your cognitive preferences. And, you know, you mentioned earlier sort of knowing what you're good at. And I, and I wonder if we could sort of like, we could sort of call this section though with the, where you crush it, you know, it's just like, where are the areas that you just bring it and it's so natural. And uh, we just look and see how the cognitive preferences may influence there, but it can be a story of just sort of thinking about a, you know, tell it tell tell the, the the listeners a story around uh where you absolutely shine so i think yeah just being i'm really good at uh just connecting people and bringing them together in a very relaxed friendly way and then also the second thing is then like deconstructing like what they're trying to accomplish so like the thought leadership management if you will is all about helping people tell their story and connecting them to other audiences which is in, it's a very kind of unique skill set, but it's something like I fully embrace. I mean, there's certainly other things I would love to be able to do, like, you know, surf. Like I would be, I'd much, I'd love to be more, <laughs> but that's not going to happen. Uh, I'd love to be a more uh, proficient kind of writer, speller, you know, there's skill sets like that, but I can either use all my time and energy trying to become a better surfer or I can use my skill set where, where I'm good at to really help other folks like tell their story. And I think just focusing on that 
is really that kind of idea of self-awareness is very critical, which, you know, it's taking time to kind of get there. Um, but that's kind of the focus. I'm, I feel like I'm rambling a bit, but here's an example. Like my mom's a first grade teacher and my spelling is horrible. Like it's really bad. And I asked my mom, like, could I always spell? And she started laughing and, um, it's just something that kind of weighs on me. But the other times I'm like, I can't worry about like, if I misspell something or mistype something or my grammar isn't perfect because if I dwell on that, you know, I'm not achieving other things. I'm using energy in a way that's not productive. So um, it's kind of being self reflective like that and kind of moving forward. Right. So you, you, I'm noticing you're, you're moving over to the challenge area and I'm going to, I'm going to hold your feet to the fire on the, on the positive side here. And so that connect and accomplish, right? Yeah. The, that language there, by the way, you know, you say you don't spell well, but uh, your language resonates, right? You've got some language here, mash up winter camp. I like, are you kidding me? Winter camp. That's awesome. Yeah, right. Think, spell. think big, act small. So, so what's that? I can't spell winter camp. <laughs> <laughs> uh you know, so, so a lot of our guests will sort of like, yeah, I connect and I accomplish, right? I pull people together, I connect them, and then we, we start, you know, what can we do with this, right? It's like, so what, what's next, and, and, and how can we make this happen? And it's sort of like this, uh, well, it's kind of natural, right? It's we downplay that because we just do it and think no big deal. Yeah. And so, yeah. We, so, so I want to come back to, okay, you're an active observer, you're an active talker, uh, active mover, uh, high associative. How do those elements come into play around bringing people together, getting them in the room, and then uh, I'm going to use a buzzword here, right? Creating some synergy, right? Yeah. To, uh, a sense of cohesion and moving forward. Tell me I about think, that. Yeah, I'm really good at uh, remaining calm in a lot of chaos. So, an example: uh, I worked for the McCain Palin campaign in 2000, and Sarah Palin. This is in October. And um, up to, no, this is 2008, sorry, 2008. Uh, she's going to do a rally in Southern California. And this is like the height of the McCain. Like, people won't believe this, but McCain and Obama, it was pretty close. Like, um, this is before the wheels fell off with the campaign. But Palin's like crazy popular. And she's going to do a rally in Southern California. So, and I have 10 days to put this together. So, I have to find a venue that can hold like 20,000 people, right? I've got to figure out logistics distribution, parking, we can working with secret service, logistics of getting her in and out from major metropolitan area. Um, the the to-do list is like AOL's like code. It's just like the list is like forever, right? Um, but I was the lead for that. And I like, you know, obviously I had a team that worked with it, worked with me to pull it off. But that idea of, um, which I think a lot of people couldn't do or couldn't execute or they wouldn't know where to start. And I think um, just kind of remaining calm looking at the big picture and kind of working backwards is something I'm really good at. I think the combination of um, being curious, you know, being observing, like just paying, like when I go to, it's crazy. Like when I go to Trader Joe's and go shopping, like I pay attention to the checkout line, <laughs> like the efficiency of it. Right. Uh, when I go to um, TS or I go to the airport and Perry knows this, like when I have to deal with TSA, I like lose my mind because I'm like, it's not efficient and, like not, it's just ridiculous, right? So, well, that, Mark, I'm I'm gonna jump in. I gotta jump in on that because that, uh, you know, just for the audience, I, I grill Mark on this all the time. And if I know I need to get a rise out of him, I'll just start talking about TSA because this <laughs> anyone who's TSA knows the TSA is a completely TSA. sequential environment. You you yeah. you are not to communicate. You walk through. There is a process, and if you miss a step of the process, then you generally have to start over, and uh, and and that doesn't sit very well with a high associative and anyone who's, who's uh, been through TSA and has, has struggled with that is probably, you know, probably senses that as well. Go ahead. Yeah, I cut you off. Environment is not. So those are the like kind of observations or thinking about how um, people, you know, I just, when I'm riding the Metro, like how people are using their handheld devices or, you know, what shoes people are wearing. Right. So anyways, I try to like absorb all this information and then, collect it and then kind of organize bigger events with a lot of moving parts uh, and develop my own processes to kind of execute them. That's what I think my like secret sauce is. So I can yeah. organize a bar mitzvah, a wedding, a presidential debate, um, you know, a speech for a CEO at Davos. That's kind of like what I'm really good at. Yeah. 
I um, I I'd, uh, connected with that. You said wedding planner. I I actually, I uh, some friends got married and they asked me to be their uh, wedding planner, and I was like me, and they're like yeah, you, you know. And it's uh, this person I had actually led uh, outdoor education programs, right, leading. 26 kids out in the woods with six instructors out in the Pacific Northwest. And uh, it is very much event based, right? It's like, okay, we got to get the kids from here to here. And the bridge was washed out because of this flood. And what do we do? Right? What's our backup plan? Yeah. That ability to juggle. You know, the thing I want to talk about for, with respect to process, um, the TSA thing, again, they have their very sequential process. Um, it's often sometimes people think that uh, high associatives, you know, aren't, uh, you know, can't be organized or, um, you know, d don't uh, understand process. And there's, uh, and, and, and vice versa, the sequentials, you know, are, are challenged by creativity. Um, and that's uh, not, not the truth at all, right? So you're going in there and deconstructing right to take it look at it and deconstruct and create your own process uh through your own preferences right um no, i totally agree i think uh to execute at the end of the day you have to create processes and to scale up and be successful so um i guess yeah i you're spot on like i totally deconstruct like the thing i love about like campaigns elections is you have an end date you know exactly when the election is and you can right. do backwards and I have clients, for example, that if they're going to speak at a trade show or a conference, I, you know, we start on that day and we work backwards and say, these are the things you need to accomplish on the way there to maximize your speech or the release of your document. And I find that very um, rewarding and very kind of easy and like almost second nature. Yeah, I think I think there's there's comfort in that. I. I, uh, you know, knowing that that endpoint is there, then, you know, then, then you're, you know, you're free to, you actually have a lot more uh, flexibility in terms of, you know, kind of backloading things. But, you know, Cam, the, the other thing that I think that, that is resonating with me here is Mark, you know, you talk about your, your observer, well, your observer preference is an 80. And, and, you know, for high observers, it, it's not as if you're, you're going, you know, outside of your bandwidth by doing what you do, you simply do do it. You walk in and you deconstruct things, you look at your visual surroundings, you, you notice people's body language, you notice their expressions, and, and that's giving you a whole wealth of information. Um, you know, you, I, I'm actually a, a very active observer myself. And, um, you know, prior to, to, uh, to uh, going into uh, more formal hospitality, which was Matchbox Restaurants, uh, I also owned a, a nightclub um, a consortium called Polyesters. But everything you just described there was exactly what what we would do. We had the framework for prep whenever we would have uh, a night um, and a very very busy night. We could do two thousand people through the door, which is as organized you know uh, chaos as, as anything one can imagine. Um, but there was a process for that, and I felt very comfortable in that process. Um, uh, yeah, I, I would and, and could you know had reached the point in, in this power or excuse me in, in the uh, active observer active listener where I could pretty much tell how the night would go or if we would run into problems later on in the night or when to you know pull the plug on it say okay we're finished for tonight because it will not get any better than this but that's that's a process that you you see you feel and you almost you live it and and again it can be a little bit like you mentioned earlier Cam a little bit of an emotional type of process as well absolutely. Yeah. Right. But, um, you know, staying tuned, right. Tuned into your environment and there's a lot of filtering going on. Right. I imagine Mark with, you know, with a, with a campaign event with Sarah Palin in Southern California, there's a tremendous amount of filtering that you're having to actively do. Right. Yeah. Both with, uh, yeah. Republicans and Democrats at the same time, but no, I yeah. Think, yeah. Um, but what's interesting about I think the cognitive preference, I think it's wonderful, obviously, to know what you're good at and kind of and like feel comfortable and embrace it. But also recognizing that other people might get more, they need more order, they need more sequence, they need more process, um, or they need to read more, they're not as visual. So um, I think that's helped because when you, especially getting back to campaigns, you're working with all kinds of different people from, you know, the volunteer who just wants to knock on doors to you know somebody running for governor and you get dealing with different pressure groups and all kinds of different characters and i think 
recognizing that other folks look at stuff differently is also a great reminder for the preference tool because it's not only, I, mean, I find it very rewarding to understand yourself better, but also recognizing that other that people process information differently is very, very critical. And it's so, all right. Yeah. And um, you're making a case for, for something that we're making a case about is, you know, that the uh, CPP is available for teams, right? And, and, you know, if you had, you know, had the CPP available, you know, in the campaign, you know, knowing this person's preference, right? Not because you can sort of get that sense, but actually to have that score, they have the score, they know your score, right? That's a, that, that can be very uh, advantageous. No, so many, yeah, I think it's spot on. I think about the dynamics, especially in a campaign, it's a crazy environment. You know, you're under, you're just underpaid. You're not eating well. You're under, you know, it's just crazy, right? So you're not sleeping well. Um, and this is a very kind of hostile, angry environment anyways. And um, especially when you're losing, but, um, but understanding the dynamics of your teammates, I think is very, very critical because at the end of the day, you know, I, I think about some of the conflicts I've had with people and it, basically it's around communication. It's not around the same goal or like what we're trying to achieve. It's the way that we're telling the story where the, the uh, problem comes in. And it's really because of preference of how we like to absorb information and recognizing that from the front end, I think it's a huge aspect for any team. And uh, the thing I'd love most, I've told this to Perry is that there's no, I feel like other surveys I've taken, there's like a right or wrong. Like you're kind of bucketed or you're like, oh, you're this person. You know, I'm like, oh, not really that, you know, I'm not in this bucket. I feel like I'm more, you know, kind of well-rounded. And I think the preference survey, the cognitive preference allows you to recognize what you're good at or basically how you absorb information, but also how other folks do it. And that's a much more powerful thing because there's no like bucket, like the Friars MIG or all these other surveys where you're like, you're in this Pigeonhole, and that's kind of ridiculous. Yeah, the world, the that's right. like that. So um, we're gonna we're gonna move in a, in this area of a, around a, just to to balance the you know your secret weapon around calm and the chaos and and uh, with with individuals and groups and and uh, connecting and accomplishing. On the flip side of that, is there um, you know you talked about writing and, and uh, spelling and um, you know, I'm just kind of curious about the 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 uh, selective listener, um, and does that come in as a blind spot at all for you, or do you have a is there can, do you have a does that resonate with you that that you know is a, is an area to watch out for? Yeah, I think the listening for me is really challenging because I think I process information so much and I consume so much information that I sometimes and my wife will say this to me when we're even meeting our friends or cocktail parties, um, I interrupt people a lot because I already know like what they're going to say. And I, I'm not intending to be rude, right? My wife tells me you're acting rude, but I'm like, I already know what you're going to say. So let's get to the bigger point. And I think sometimes that is a challenge where I need to like, it's a huge challenge for me where I need to step back, let the person speak whatever they want to say, and not interrupt them. Um, but, and I'm, but I feel like it's not, I already know what they're going to say. It's kind of an interesting dynamic. Right. That's the, this, um, the mix of the high associative and the high observer together, you know, br brings in this sort of this intuitive element, right. Of, um, yeah. the ability to, the ability to sort of, uh, predict what's going to happen and Hey, you know, with that high associative is let's, ch let's cut to the chase exactly. and you've, and you've got that high talker, right. That you're, that's how you're building knowledge. Right. High talker, high mover. Yeah, like I love to uh, have a conversation at a very kind of rapid pace, if you will. Yeah. Um, it's funny. I've been listening to more and more podcasts. And I, this is a very interesting. So I listen to them at 1.5, right? So faster. Yeah. 60-minute podcast I can do in like 40 minutes. And then I find when I like DVR shows now or I watch stuff on YouTube, like I want it to be faster. I want it to be like watching, you know, CNBC in the morning. I want it to be like – faster um because i can process information quicker where it's um but maybe that's not you know that's good or bad that's just kind of the way it is which is kind of interesting right i i think of that as more of the mover uh the high mover and and really absorbing uh, consuming at a higher rate um so i'm a i'm a on the balanced or lower side of mover and uh, i try that i try you know going faster with the podcast 
and um, I really I like the natural cadence of the host, and it's see, and, and I'm a high listener, right? Very high listener. So that that uh, that unnaturalness distracts me, and so I just bring it down. And again, I'm, it's I've got to hear it at this level. Um, and I think it's again, it's this rate of consumption. I heard. So I've been listening to uh, you know this one podcast, and I heard this person actually on TV live at normal speed, and I didn't recognize. <laughs> His voice, because I was just <laughs> oh. <laughs> like, oh man, this is so weird. Well, you know, Mark, the, the one thing I, I want to mention, um, especially to the audience, is that you know, again, there is no one size fits all here. Um, it, it's how you know your perception of your cognitive preferences. Um, uh, Howard Gardner, um, really, the work is based on Howard Gardner's work out of Harvard um, around multiple intelligences. And it mentioned before on other broadcasts is that, you know, the way that he saw it is that he called them uh, lasers. Um, you know, if you might be a little bit more active in a certain preference, uh, be it mover, observer, reader, talker, listener, or um, something that might be a little bit more of a searchlight or a flashlight, so a little bit wider beam, so to speak. Um, but, but each individual preference can activate another one. So in other words, if you, know, you mentioned here, let me tie this together. You mentioned that you're, you're a little bit less of an active reader. Um, I am too. Now, I, I can tell you that I scored very high on my SATs and on the verbal, um, but I read differently. You know, the way that I read, um, if I really need to take something into active memory, is to read aloud. And I, I will labor over every word to make sure that I'm getting every word and, and, just, and, and slow my pace down. Um, and slow my delivery down so that I, I can absorb that information. Um, another way that I might look at my reading as well is, is I'm an active uh, you know, user of highlighters. I go through so many highlighters all the time because being a bit more of an active mover, um, I have found that I physicalize the reading with the highlighter or taking a pen and making extra notes. Yeah. And then I can take that information again more you know, and, and make it, make it, a little bit more part of my active memory to be able to utilize that information. Another cog hack that I do too is I might read when I'm walking because I'm huh. activating my mover, which activates my brain. And I'm, and, and I'm, and I'm pretty good. I'm a high observer too. So I don't usually walk into doors, um, but I can, I can pretty much go, go in, in that mode. And so, you know, again, th there's no, there's no real solution, but I think that the one thing that this, there was a story that when we were working with some members of the military, um, one of the directors of a particular unit, uh, we, we assessed the entire unit in, in, the, in the, uh, the CPP, and one of the directors of the unit or the leaders was a very, very high reader, and his methodology was to dump an entire brick of paperwork on everyone's desk in the unit in the morning, and, and then they were accountable for all of that information. Well, all of those people were mostly lower readers. They just didn't yeah. activate for text. And so they were, you know, they, they were running around like chicken. They admitted this. They said, we're running around like chickens with their head, heads cut off. And when, when we just were able to show them that, it, the, the room just erupted in laughter. And they said, my gosh, you're the first person who's actually figured it out. Um, and, and, then, and then he understood it too. And he said, oh, wow. He goes, I'm, I'm, just, not, I'm, I'm just loading up on people. And, and they're not getting half of what I'm trying to get across to them. So he actually adapted he became a bit more visual in his briefings and, and it worked out better. And so, so again, the information flow was, was, uh, was greatly accentuated based on that. No, it's, it's critical. I mean, the, the clients we were, it's, that's a great story because the clients we work with, they assume people like to receive information the way they do. And um, it's critical to, um, to not like you, you have your own biases when you tell your stories or, you know, if you love a certain social media platform, you can't assume everybody likes it that way or everybody like doesn't like email or you have to like as a communicator sometimes, unfortunately you have to use all these different tools to tell your story. And uh, the cognitive preference really reinforces that because at the end of the day, if you're trying to motivate lead folks, you got to use different tools to get that done. Not the tools you like. Yeah. So the thing that's got my attention, you know, I, I'm going to, I'm going to gently push back on your score here. I don't think you're a 10 listener. Um, yeah, it's higher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> no friend, no friend. Uh, no, higher because here we are, we're at, a, we're at an hour, right? We've been talking for about an hour and you're here attentive, you know, hearing what we're saying. 
and that you know if you're a connector and you're you're taking in information yes there's the there's the observer and there's the high associative and the intuition piece but there's also some kind of uh listener sampling right you're getting the the salient information and putting it into practice you know so that to me is not a 10 you know so i'm i'm going to give you you come on the podcast. We're going to give you a couple bonus points here in the listener column. Is that all right? <laughs> That's great. I think though the listener, I would, I think it's, I don't know, maybe it is higher than the ten, but um, it's a like I'm. It's like to do this. Like I love these conversations, but you know, it takes a lot of energy for me to stay focused and like right. kind of about and be engaged and be present. But that's something I'm like working on. But getting back, to, like I think the preference tells you that because I don't want to be seen as a low listener, right? So the preference says, hey, this is something you should work on. You should be more present, be more focused. And um, having discussions like this are really, really helpful. Yeah, and, and that um, you just made a really important point, Mark, around, again, a, a 10 listener, you know, or, or a, a 15 reader. It doesn't mean you can't do it. That's right. It just takes more energy, right? It's a matter of, um, you know, and if you're a high observer, it takes less energy. Right, it's more natural. So, not that you it can't be done. It's just takes a little more uh, effort to activate those synapses. Yeah, exactly. I mean, for me, the preference survey is like this is how I like to perceive information. I mean, I'll read a good 30, 40 books a year. I'm a voracious reader. I actually still get newspapers delivered to my house, old school. Um, I love magazines, but it's funny too what you said about Perry or Perry. You were saying like I too like love the tangible. Like I need to hold something like the Kindle. Yep. The worlds don't work, but like actually holding paper and like taking notes. Like right. I too am a victor, a uh, victim of highlighting endlessly or making notes. And um, but I pr would much rather receive information like moving is you know or doing some other kind of activity or observing, watching films or documentaries. Um, but Cameron, I think you're spot on. I think that to me, what's been rewarding about the preference survey is that it's like, hey, this is what you're good at. This is what you like, but it's all right that you're in this bucket. You know, it's not, you're not doomed to fail or uh, be on the sidelines where other tests, I think, or surveys like really say, ah, oh, this is it. You're limited. Yeah, you're not stuck. I mean, yeah, the you're stuck. In, well, in well, but Mark, and, and everyone, everyone has their own workarounds. And, and that's what we get at here. That's what we're really trying to get at here with this, you know, the Wired to Lead podcast is what people need to understand is, is everyone is different. You, you find your way. Um, you know, you're successful um, and, and you figured it out. Um, and, and you just, I think the key to it, again, is illuminating the blind spots and, and, and also understanding the things that you rely on consistently. Um, you know that, that guide you, and and to make it to make it actionable and and become a little bit more conscious of it. Nothing wrong with that. You know, I mean, it's it used to be that um, that the definition I think from you know our parents might have been that that hey you're you're undisciplined. Um, no, that, I, I don't think that definition applies anymore. It really doesn't. Um, there, there's a little bit more nuance here, and, and there's no reason why we can't you know we can't understand that uh, that a, a bit of metacognition can do as well. Yeah, and turning it back to Brigadier, like, I think it, that's why it's helpful even to have like a multi-decade kind of viewpoint or vision, like you're like, this is a 20-year project or 25-year project. So you don't have to accomplish everything in year one, year three, year four. Um, allowing yourself the space to kind of achieve stuff over a longer period can be rewarding. I agree. Well, listen, I know we're winding down. I, I, I want to, uh, we've talked about Brigadier in a little bit. Can you tell anyone listening or watching the podcast, can you tell them where they can go to get tickets for Brigadier? Um, uh, I'm, I'm a big advocate of it. I'm, I'm just completely disappointed from a scheduling standpoint that I can't make it this year. I will be there next year. Uh, where do people need to go and, and what information do they need to, uh, to uncover to, to get out to Sundance? Sure. It's super easy. It's uh, the Brigadier. B R I G A D O O N, <laughs> my spelling, <laughs> dot com. Um, super easy, has all the information there, and um, love to have you. We ha like, it's capped at 50 people, it's very intimate, power PowerPoint free environment. Uh, fire no chat, we'll fire. Um, so it's great. I think we've got like uh, 10 spots left open, so we've got a room for a few more people. Perfect. And what is a Brigadoon? So what, what is Brigadoon? Uh, Scott, it's a, a play musical a lot of people know but the idea it derives from this kind of legendary town in the highlands of scotland it's kind of mystical it's kind of enchanted almost sort of shangri-la 
uh, a place undisturbed. And uh, so we've kind of embraced that ethos around Brigadoon, you know, the idea of like being in a special kind of mountain town, very holistic, natural beauty, and then just really kind of stripping it down and having conversations, not overwhelmed by technology or AV products, um, and allowing people to really have a good conversation with some interesting people for a few days. Oh, perfect. Well, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a big advocate of it. I, I really respect your effort there. And, and I know that this uh, is going to be very, very successful this season here. So I wish you luck with that. But um, I do want to thank you again for coming on the, uh, on the podcast. And Cam, thank you very much. Um, I'll tell our listeners as well, if, if they're interested in assessing uh, themselves or they have uh, teammates or, you know, again, a group assessment or an individual, they can go to www.avalonleadership.com. Uh, you can also follow us on Twitter at Avalon Lead. Um, and for more information, we have other assessments as well. Um, uh, you know, we are at, at the Avalon Institute about thinking, being, and doing. Uh, we're always interested in your story, uh, always interested in, uh, in being able to assist or help in any manner possible. We are a business advisory. Uh, we also focus on thought leadership. Um, but we are, are uh, uh, based out of the D.C. area, um, but we also have teammates all the way across the country as well. So, again, thank you guys very much. Uh, Cam, I'm going to give you the last word before we sign off here and, uh, and tell us what has your attention. Yeah, just uh, what has my attention is um, I'm trying to figure out how to get to Brigadoon in, uh, in 2018. That's what I'm trying to figure out. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. You know. Come out. Well, yeah, man. Uh, if not this year, definitely next year. Uh, Perry right. and I will uh, will fly out of Dulles together. So no, hey, wait a second. Hold on. Let's be straight about it. Delta straight flight, right out of out of DCA straight yeah. flight. Uh, three hours, is that right, Mark? Maybe uh, four. Yeah, three and a half, four. Yeah. Okay. And, it's fun. and you're yeah. on the slopes within an hour and a half of of, uh, of landing in um, in Salt Lake City. That's yeah. correct. So, so, Mark, I've really enjoyed uh, really enjoyed meeting you today and uh getting to know your story and um just uh you know there, there's some really great stuff I, I think that uh coming back with this you use the word curiosity i'm a big curiosity fan right um curiosity in the sense of this healthy gap between the knowledge that you have and the knowledge that you don't have right and recognizing that that you it's not a matter of knowing everything but starting with something and then there's always more to build. And that seems like it's what's really missing in the world. So, um, you know, that, that this is a big part of thought leader management and um, being curious about other people, uh, how they, how they work, how they operate, what they have to offer. Yeah. You know, and just, uh, it's really refreshing to hear of your, just, um, you know, you're one of the innovative disruptors out there. You're, you're, you're your own man right? You're really comfortable in your skin. And so just, we appreciate you coming on and, and sharing uh, your stories and uh, being a part of the Avalon team. No, this is great. I really, I'm thrilled to uh, have joined you guys this morning and uh, look forward to more conversations, uh, whether in Utah or other uh, parts of the country or online or offline. Well, and you're also welcome to come back, you know, bring, bring more topics and uh, we'd love to have you back on Wired to Lead. Absolutely. That'd be great. All right, gentlemen, thank you very much. And uh, to the listeners, you guys have a great day and we will uh, see you soon on another edition of the Wired to Lead podcast. Take care. Many thanks to our guest today. And if you enjoyed this podcast and want to know more about how you are wired to lead, go to www.avalonleadership.com where our round table is always open. Once again, the assessment is called the Cognitive Peak Profile and it might actually change your life. For more info on the Avalon Institute and our advisory services and other products, send an email to info at avalonleadership.com. Special thanks to our producer, Brendan Kaunaki of Washington, D.C.-based Kaunaki Media. Please visit his website at www.kaunakimedia.com. Thanks for joining us, and please tune in to our next broadcast, always available on SoundCloud.